The next thing is two concepts that are very, very important, moral hazard and adverse selection. Well, you know, some textbooks and, and some of us call them instead hidden information or hidden type versus hidden action. So the hidden information, some of us, I mean, we, the, the equivalently, we call it adverse selection. Hidden action, uh, it's also known as moral hazard. So what is the idea? So the hidden information is the following. Before signing the contract, agent has some private information that matters for not only the, uh, not only for the agent, but also for the uh, principal. And so the agent has private information about the true state of the world before signing the contract. And the insurance company, obviously, decides to offer a, an optimal contract without knowing this private information. All right. So uh, you can think of an example like a person, the agent can be healthy or sick, like maybe no pre-existing condition or maybe some pre-existing condition. So this is the private information of the agent and the insurance company doesn't know whether this agent has this private information or what type of customer uh, he's dealing with. So the, uh, the, uh, uh, the same language of incomplete information games, here the uh, uh, principal cannot distinguish the true type of the customer. And because of the lingo used in the uh, insurance market, uh, it's called the hidden information uh, scenarios are also called adverse selection. So you write a contract, the principal writes a contract, prepares a contract for, for example, healthy individual and, and probably a different contract for people who have pre-existing condition. But you, as a principal, you cannot really force them to buy one contract because you can't know uh, which, which customer is is, is what type. And so therefore you just hope that the healthy guy is going to buy the uh, contract, which is designed specifically for him or for them. And the uh, sick person is going to buy the contract, which is designed specifically for them. And so this may or may not happen depending on how well you design those contracts. And so the selection made by the uh, uh, customers uh, could have uh, sort of, uh, uh, result in an outcome which is not what you uh, were looking for, all right? So this is why we call it also adverse selection. Well, the other form of possible scenarios is what's called hidden action. So hidden information is worried about before signing the contract. Hidden action is the situations after signing the contract. Well, here in cases of hidden action, agents action during the term of the contract, meaning after signing the contract and while the contract is in place, uh, the action of the agent is not observable to the principal. All right. Um, so again, because of the uh, sort of a, uh, the lingo used in the health insurance or the health market, uh, we call it moral hazard situations. Um, example, you know, once people get insurance, right? Uh, they may become reckless or they may uh, show reckless behavior after getting insurance. Why? Well, because you think you already have the insurance. For example, car insurance. You already think that you have full coverage, full insurance. So, you know what? You don't really have to be, you know, extremely careful about driving. And so you may become reckless once you get the uh, uh, insurance. So the problem is obviously the insurance company does not want you to be reckless after you buy the insurance. So in order to eliminate those type of unwanted behaviors, how should you design the uh, uh, contract? So you see what I mean? Um, all right. So few examples, uh, consider a firm and there are shareholders who own, you know, part of the firm and there's a manager, CEO, for example. So principal is the shareholders an agent is the manager. And well, here the hidden information may be 
uh, managerial skill, right? How skillful this CEO is. Well, that's probably a private information. Well, of course, if you work with this guy long enough, you probably learn how skillful he is. Or if this guy has already a very strong CV, you probably know how skillful he is. But if this is, for example, a recent graduate you're planning to hire as a manager, or if he is changing uh, uh, the, the, the sector he was working previously, and so he has no previous background or experience in the market that your firm is operating. And so his CV may not actually give you enough of information. And so managerial skill can actually be hidden information. Well, what about the hidden action? Well, obviously you want to offer this guy uh, some wage, right? Well, the thing is when you offer him wage, you do not want him to shirk, meaning get the salary and do nothing. Well, you want him to work. Same for, I don't know, uh, in, in sports, uh, football players or basketball players. So if you give them crazy amount of fixed money, like I'm going to pay you $10 million per year, whether you play the game or not, well, the guy doesn't really have incentive to play the game, right? Because he can get the money without doing anything. So this is not really a good contract. So Obviously, in, in a sports, the effort can be observable, but in, the, uh, in, in case of a CEO, for example, uh, the guy may actually put a lot of effort, but maybe he was unlucky. Maybe the economy was horrible as it was this year. And so this is why the profits were, were, were terrible. You see what I mean? So the shareholders may not observe the effort put by the uh, manager perfectly. And so it may be hidden action. All right. And again, the problem here is that when principals decides a contract, he not only needs to worry about the information which is hidden, he also may uh, worry about effort or sort of the action that is going to be hidden to him. So what is the optimal uh, contract you should design so that you give uh, the agent right incentives to put the effort you want him to put and sort of the higher the person you want to hire. So you probably do not want to hire someone uh, who has no uh, ability, no skill at all, right? So how should you design the contract? So here are all good examples where moral hazard and adverse selection are coexisting. Another example, a manager and employee. Employee is the agent, manager is the principal. And here again, the job uh, skills may be hidden information. And again, the effort could be the hidden action. The car owner could be the principal, the mechanic is the agent. And so for the car owner, you may not know how skillful this mechanic is, or you may not observe whether your car needs uh, a, a fix or not or you don't know what type of fix your car needs. So here, you may not observe those information and you may also not observe the effort. So maybe the guy did nothing to your car, but he's charging some money. Or maybe he changed some parts of the car that actually didn't, I mean, wasn't required to be changed. And so he's charging a lot of money. So the question is, you probably cannot observe the type of the, or the information, which is hidden, like the skill. And you can also, you may not also observe the action of the agent. And so when you write a contract, probably you have to worry, or you have to take into these two into consideration. Student versus tutor. Uh, tutor is the agent, student is the principal, hidden information is the subject knowledge. So how knowledgeable the tutor is and the hidden action may be how prepared, how well prepared the tutor is before, uh, I mean, you know, once you start uh, 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 tutoring. Or could be the monopoly and the customer, and so the monopoly is the principal, customer is the agent, and so the, how much this customer values for, his, for this good, meaning his willingness to pay, may be a hidden information. Or sort of the, the same example I keep repeating, the insurance company is the principal, customer is the agent, and the pre-existing health conditions may be the hidden information, and the risky activities, for example, once you get a life insurance, you start uh, climbing mountains, uh, you, you start bungee jumping, but before the health insurance or life insurance, you, you, you were not doing this. And so 
uh, you may actually not observe all the actions that the agent is taking. And so once you design a contract, you have to take all these into consideration. All right. Well, as I said, in order to eliminate some of the negative impacts of asymmetric information, we look at contracts. What is the optimal contract? And we call them like first best, second best, third best, etc. So what do we mean by first best or first best contract? Uh, the first best contract is basically uh, the, 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 the benchmark outcome where uh, all information is perfectly observable by all the players. All right. Again, this is hypothetical. In reality, unfortunately, these cases are, are very rare. But if all informations were available, what would be the optimal contracts? So those contracts, we're going to call them first best. The second best contract is, again, the contract that maximizes the uh, payoff or the surplus of the principal, given the constraint that the agent is more informed uh, than the principal. All right. So this informational asymmetry becomes a, a constraint. So under this constraint, what is the optimal contract for the principal? So this optimization problem, which we will formally look at uh, next, is it has a solution. It's, it's going to give us some contract. And those contracts, we're going to call them second best. Well, the thing is, you may actually add additional uh, constraints. Like, for example, the contract has to be simple in the sense that, for example, you have to charge a fixed price uh, per output you sell. All right. So if you have additional constraints other than the informational constraint that I just mentioned in the second best, well, we call those the, the solution of the optimization problem as the third best contract. Well, you don't have to stop there. You may add additional constraints, but the more constraints you add, well, it becomes the fourth best, fifth best, etc. All right. Most of the times, obviously, we look at the first best because, as I said, it's a benchmark. Like what would be the best possible outcome? Um, and then we obviously look at it the second best. So obviously we can't achieve the first best. What would be the second best? But sometimes the firms are re or the principles are restricted to, uh, you know, design contract that is simple enough because of the government regulations, because of the behavioral uh, limitations of the customer. So whatever the reason is, we may sometimes look at the third best. All right. But that's what we mean by uh, you know, first best, second best, and third best. I hope that was clear.